Uh, is that everyone in? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the May POGO session. Um, this meeting, as you will have heard from the um, little automatic robot voice, is uh, being recorded uh, for posterity. Um, we have a great panel today to discuss the procurement bill, which uh, has recently been introduced into Parliament. And uh, our ringmaster for proceedings today is uh, the wonderful Michael Bauscher QC, who is known to many of you. Uh, he's a member of Moncton Chambers. He's been in all the big procurement cases. And he's also a visiting professor at King's College London, but don't mention marking to him. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Michael, uh, who is going to uh, introduce our expert panel and keep everyone to time. Um, please do drop your thoughts and comments and questions into the chat. We'll collect them up around midway through the session and then have um, a, an opportunity for the panelists to respond. So please do uh, join in the debate. Michael, over to you. Thank you, Anne. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a very exciting to be able to talk about uh, the, the procurement bill. It's arrived. Uh, we have a very open, open question, which each of our speakers are going to speak to for three or four minutes. And uh, basically, in short, is it transformative? It's quite a very open question. And one might say, is it transformative of law? Is it transformative of society? Or, as, or, and I suppose some, some of our speakers may say, no, it's very disappointing. It's not transformative, but we look forward to hearing some interesting and exciting opinions on this important piece of legislation. Um, I've promised everyone I'll be super positive. Um, so my super positivity about this piece of legislation is the first time since the Second World War, the Houses of Parliament are actually going to debate some primary legislation about public procurement beyond the sort of the odd section here and there, like the Social Value Act or Section 17 of the Local Government Act. So we're actually going to have a, a real debate um, by our legislators about something that is important, is, as important as this. You might think it was a few decades too late um, and, and reflect, but 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 never, never too late. It's, let's take this exciting uh, opportunity, and it'll be very interesting to hear from people what they think our uh, legislators should be focusing on in that debate. It's interesting, I just look, looking this morning at some of the amendments which were all already being put up for uh, to be moved in, in the committee stage about to start, uh, and a, a number of them pick up on some of the issues which one can expect to be debated. Quite a few around the long history of problems in Ministry of Defence procurement and uh, an another longish proposed uh, um, amendment pro by, pro pro proposed by Baroness Heyman, um, reintroducing quite a lot of the material that came out of this version of the, um, uh, the, the final version of the bill as published. Um, to, to reintroduce some of the some of the more general principles such as transparency and so forth in a more hard-edged way than they have perhaps appeared in the bill. I'm not going to take up more time commenting on on the detail. Um, um, th there are other opportunities for that, and I'm assuming that this audience has already read the bill and at least formed its first thoughts for itself. Um, let's move straight into the the great team that we have for you today. Um, I'm not going to introduce them um, in, in any detail, uh, so as not to take up their time. So first, launching off, perhaps uh, Professor Albert Sanchez-Grails um, from Bristol, if you could join us and give us your thoughts. Is it transformative? Um, well, thank you, Michael. Um, I thought we were going alphabetically, so I was waiting to just say everything has been said before. Um, but I guess the short answer is it's, it's not transformative, in my view. Um, the, the few elements of the transforming public procurement package that can be transformative, so open data, single register for suppliers, have nothing to do with the legislation. Um, but also the bits that might be transformative or might deviate from EU law are yet to be seen. So somehow this webinar takes place a bit too early because we only see the tip of the iceberg of what will be the very lengthy package of primary, secondary, legislation and guidance. So um, I, I don't see a transformation. What, what I see is a very strong willingness 
uh, maybe for reputational reasons, to deviate from EU law terminology. And I think that's what has already um, had all lawyers scared because we, we don't know what these things will mean. So uh, maybe even the answer that we will know whether it's transformative when the secondary legislation and guidance are in place is even too optimistic. Maybe we'll have to wait for a wave of cases afterwards to test what things mean and how different they are from where we are at. So um, basically not transformative for now, and in my view, very low prospects of it being truly transformative other than in things that have nothing to do with the law, like the platform and OCDS. Okay, um, our next speaker is Kristen Robinson, who's Head of Advocacy at Open Contracting Partnership. Kristen, would you like to comment? Sure. Hello. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for, for having me here today. And, and I would agree with uh, Albert. It's sort of, you know, we got it at Open Contracting Partnership. This is what we do every day, trying to open up contracts and make sure that procurement's really, that the power of procurement to impact people's lives, to drive social and economic change as another policy lever is really recognized. And I think we got very excited about the green paper. We saw a lot in there that we liked, but then it felt like in the draft bill, maybe the government uh, shied away from really having that ambition and that vision and translating that into the bill. Um, and there's been a lot of debate around what belongs in primary and secondary legislation and, and how much do we need to enshrine in primary legislation to make sure that principles like transparency, like the single rule book, like the digital transformation and, and clear data standards are impossible to deviate from versus making sure that this bill has a shelf life that can adapt as, as time progresses. And I think that's where the real debate's going to be. And I think we saw that very clearly in the House of Lords second reading with a lot of Lords discussing, um, you know, this the prospect of this becoming a skeleton bill and not having enough uh, in the primary legislation to make sure that it truly is transformational. So I think we're still very much pushing in that direction. And I think for us, making sure that the transparency principle is in there and in a testable way, making sure that we have a single rule book so that we don't just have fragmentation through various exemptions. I mean, one notable exemption was that the, the NHS could be exempt from the procurement regulation, which then seems a little bit um, counterintuitive considering all of the scandals that we recently saw, like surely we would want to make sure that the NHS is held, is following the same standards as the rest of that single rule book. Um, so still some way to go, I think, from our perspective and the UK Anti-Corruption Coalition has shared a 10 point plan. I'll drop it in chat and would encourage everybody to look at that in more detail. Thank you, Kristen. Um, so I saw, yes, now the next speaker is Caroline Nicholas, who's going to, uh, looks as if she's in Vienna. Uh, um, you can never, I'm, I don't always take people's backdrops at face value, but it looks looks as if she's, she's bringing, us the, bringing us the thoughts from the United Nations. Um, Caroline, of course, has been around, has, 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 has had to actually do the hard work of drafting a procurement law for the benefit of everyone. Um, and so, if, if, and to think about how to uh, take it put into effect through the guide to enactment at answer trial. So, um, transformative or not, Caroline? And if if not, what 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 do we what are we going to what, what what do we need to look for going forward? What's your what's your pundit your your sporting pundits sort of tips to look forward going forward? Okay, so. Actually, I'm going to say something slightly different for the last two speakers, Michael. Uh, thank you. Yes, I am in Vienna, um, where it's hot and windy. So um, forgive me drinking iced water. But I think it is transformative, but not in the way that we would like it to be. Um, in preparing for today, I've actually just come out of a webinar for Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. And um, I think their laws are actually closer to what we would recommend even with all sorts of problems than the UK's at the moment. And it's about transparency that I'm a bit a lot concerned. I went through, and I carefully annotated and wrote it down on a piece of paper, which is a stupid thing to do, all the words that concern me, because they mean we're deferring things to people like Michael and judges and so on. So I found 31 reasonablys and 33 reasonables, so it might be the other way around. Now, some of them are not actually relevant, but no law should have that in it because nobody knows what's going on. 
Um, you can't you can't tell now i understand what's what needed here what's transformative is moving away from the concept of a single market to more of the gpa unsatral approach which is you're operating what i will call fairer more equal treatment but the single market obligations are not there so i would expect to see that but i don't see that at all i see the stuff about you've got to treat treaty parties fairly but anything else goes well that's always been the case if you take the EU as a treaty. So I don't see that as transformative. What I do see transformative is that um, the standard prescription, and this comes from the UN Convention Against Corruption, is that you've got to set out all the get rules of the game in advance. And I understand that if you say in your tender documents or solicitation documents, whatever, we can change the rules as we go along. That is technically setting out the rules in advance, but I think it is not it is respecting the letter and not the spirit. And that's my biggest concern in that a lot of lip service is paid to transparency and competition and so on. But the actual words to me indicate a more, if it feels good, do it approach, which is might be what goes on in the, the private sector and would all be fine, but they're spending our money. And so this is not what I would call um, uh, uh, you know, appropriate. Um, they have taken some things from UNCITRAL and sort of supercharged them. So last week, um, and I was on a webinar, I talked about the question of refining award criteria, which is permitted with some limitations um, in, in um, the competitive method that isn't open tendering that we don't know what it is. Now, to be fair, UNCITRAL said that you can do this in the context of framework agreements and they've actually tracked something that's a little bit similar to UNCITRAL. And the whole point of that is the framework agreements are several years old and one of the big criticisms of them is that, that after a couple of years, they're no longer in date. But we said, um, um, you can only do things with certain limits. We have the same sort of ideas. You've got to provide for it in the notice and in the you know, documents and so on. You can't change the descriptions. They've taken that, but they've applied that for any old procurement. And I don't understand how that is compatible with basic transparency obligations, because unlike the other modification rules, where if you change things that would have allowed people or encourage people to participate who now are no longer participating. You don't get that if you're changing your uh, award criteria during the process. Now that may be a slip or it may be intentional, but I view that as allowing the sort of, if it feels good, do it approach that is rather against what we recommend in the UN Convention Against Corruption and in UNCITRAL, just an example. So, so to do something that I what said I wouldn't do, that, what, how did it strike you, Caroline, in, in the bill, with the, in the provision where we look at the objectives, it now just says that uh, integrity is something that one should have regard to. Is that something, is that consistent with practice elsewhere? Um, from my own perspective, it seemed a, a departure from what we're supposed to be doing under UNCAC, it seemed rather a bit of a downgrade, but maybe I'm being unduly sensitive. Well, I did put, I'm, I, I will actually do what I shouldn't do. And I'm just gonna share a screen if you don't mind so you can see actually what, what the various things say. So you can see here, UNCAC says it's got to be effective in preventing corruption. The GPA says you've got to do it in a way that prevents corrupt practices. We only talk about promoting the integrity of, and then here's the procurement, uh, the procurement bill. Um, acting and be seeing to act with integrity. I don't think the words themselves in the objectives are that different because we're all a bit soft. And I think what really matters is whether or not the principles are implemented or turned into rules that express them in a good enough way. And obviously I'm not able to comment on behalf of the UN Convention Against Corruption, but it, this law I don't think complies with the answer trial model as regards transparency. Thank you. Okay. Um, so taking a different perspective, um, Kieran McGaughy is probably 
not no giving no clues away from his backdrop, but he's probably speaking to us from somewhere in the northeast. He was in, he was purporting to be in Durham last week, according to his LinkedIn. So he might still be somewhere up in the northeast. And um, I'm hoping, Kieran, you'll be able to tell us about how transformative, either in a good or a bad way, uh, your group of local local government lawyers sees this as being for either your, the lawyers as lawyers or, or 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 your communities and the societies which you serve. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's, uh, it's a great privilege to be invited back to speak here again today, uh, particularly in such esteemed company. Um, so I'm, I'm not in Durham today, I'm just up the road in Newcastle, um, not quite as exotic as Vienna, but probably similarly cold. Um, so in terms of the question, is the procurement bill transformative? Um, I agree with the first two speakers. I think the answer to that question is no. Um, it's certainly not going to transform local government procurement, um, but to be honest, I don't think it was ever going to live up to that uh, very high billing. Perhaps a more realistic title may have been improving public procurement. I appreciate that's a less exciting headline and people might not have bothered to read the consultation in that case. So will the contents of this bill improve public procurement or perhaps more accurately, will they improve public procurement law? I think that really remains to be seen. We always knew this was going to be a guidance heavy regime and likewise it would be secondary legislation. So I think I'm in the same camp as Albert from earlier in terms of I think we really await seeing the substantive content of that guidance, the depth and quality of the new training programme before we can really make a properly informed assessment of the quality of this new regulatory regime. Anyway. I'm going to get off the fence for a moment and in the meantime I'm going to very quickly talk through some of the positive and negative feedback which I've uh, gathered so far from local government lawyers. So first up, what are the good bits? Increased scope for service user choice. There's always seemed to me to be a bit of an inherent tension between procurement law and some of the council's obligations to individuals under social care law for example, so we do welcome the new provisions in that regard. There is um, perhaps more recognition and focus on the importance of the actual contracting stage as opposed to purely the initial procurement stage. I do think that focus is welcome. Uh, likewise, the move from meet to mat, uh, if nothing else, reinforces a council's ability to take account of other factors besides price. Quite interesting, particularly from a local government perspective, is the bill provides for a possible future disapplication of section 17 of the Local Government Act 1988. Now, just to remind delegates, that is the legislation here in England, which prevents councils from taking account of so-called non-commercial considerations, such as the location of a supplier when making decisions on contracts and procurement. So that law has obviously raised its ugly head recently in terms of council contracts with Gazprom, the energy supplier linked to the Russian state. And those rules have made it problematic for councils who have wanted to uh, terminate uh, their Gazprom contracts following the invasion of Ukraine. Um, likewise, some of you will recall that that law also has prevented councils in recent years from implementing the PPN around reserving contracts for local suppliers. The new regime will also be quicker uh, in terms of the some of the minimum time periods for tenders to be open. So that's the good bits. What about some of the bad bits then? More work. I think that's the key concern for local authorities uh, and particularly local authority legal departments. Uh, local authorities and other buyers will now need to publish an increasing assortment of notices, more detailed evaluation feedback, possibly KPIs, redacted contracts. I would really share the concerns in the local government associations briefing last week in response to the bill. Uh, Rory very kindly shared that on the event page if anyone wants to have a look at it. And uh, what they said was that councils are increasingly facing significant capacity issues in the procurement workforce due to challenges with recruitment and retention. We, the LGA, are seeking a further discussion with government on a nationally funded approach to upskilling council procurement officers to support the effective implementation of the government's proposals. And it won't surprise you that I would very much echo those sentiments from my own experience. The Queen's speech promised that public sector procurement will be simplified. Now, I must admit, it may just be me, but when I'm reading this bill on an evening, it doesn't look all that much simpler to me. I'll give you an example. The rules on modifications in area us lawyers are often asked to advise upon. 
Regulation 72 will now become Section 69, but Section 69 also cross-references Schedule 8. So what you're now doing is looking in two different areas of the Act to find the answer, rather than just one, which obviously is what you would do under the current legislation. The law also won't be all in one place. As some of our previous speakers have touched upon, you're going to have to navigate primary legislation, secondary legislation, and presumably some pretty voluminous guidance so given the stated intention was to consolidate the regulations into one place, this does seem counterproductive. In conclusion then, the bill has proved a bit of a mixed bag so far for local government procurement. We really will have to wait and see though whether it can improve the legal regime. Either way though, the bill will do nothing to exacerbate the financial and resource pressures which are hampering councils from improving, if not transforming, how we procure. Thank you very much for listening and I will now hand you back to Michael. Michael, you're muted. Thank you. I don't know how that happened. Inadvertent. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, my next, our next speaker, um, Malcolm Harbour, was chair of the Internal Market Committee when at the time that the 2014 directives um, went through the European Parliament. So in a sense, He's sort of chair of the last legislative body to actually have a go at our procurement law in any real in any real sense as the as the regulations I think probably were I, I can't now remember I think I think the I think they were laid on the house and whipped whipped away in about as quickly as they possibly could be so this is a, an, an interesting perspective on what you think is what, what what do you think's been transformed from the last time you looked at our procurement law Malcolm. <laughs> Well, thank you for the introduction. I was going to remark, uh, as you said, that there were plenty of politicians involved in the European Parliament in this. And I, I just want to point out also, and this is well documented, that my committee spent five years working on this uh, because we did uh, two and a half years of preparatory work, during which, by the way, we consulted national parliaments. Disappointingly, no British member of parliament turned up for that consultation. No members of the House of Lords did. So I'm pleased it started in the House of Lords. But I mean, I'm absolutely clear about this. This is absolutely not a transformative directive. Uh, in my view, the transformation of public procurement uh, away from a simply a price-based system uh, towards what I think um, most participants, probably all participants on this call would say is the way in which we should be regarding procurement, which is actually a way to improve the way that we deliver services um, and, and products in the public service. Um, I mean, that was started um, certainly in European legislation, but the 2014 bill was, was pretty radical. Uh, and what was most interesting about that from my perspective um, is that I worked really closely with the cabinet office during that period. Um, and um, those of you that are familiar with this process will know that the UK government of all the major economies in, in, the UK, in Europe introduced the bill far quicker than any other because it was so pleased with the outcome. Now, frankly, you know, since 2015 and the implication of that is not very long ago. And I was rather astonished when I saw the preamble to this new bill, which suggested that everything was bad uh, and the new thing is going to be good. It certainly isn't. And indeed, I go further than that, because actually, um, if you look at the record on this and the detailed research, you will see that United Kingdom actually used the provisions in the bill to encourage more innovative suppliers to use the new tools in the bill than any other country within the European Union or the economic area apart from Norway. We were actually in the a very large report done by Price Waterhouse. Uh, we were ranked second. Now, I didn't see any of that in the procurement bill preamble. Um, my real worry is that actually, there are many local authorities, and indeed, if you look at the UK regions, Wales and Scotland are far advanced than England, who are already using these provisions successfully uh, for innovative procurement, for green procurement, for social procurement. We'll hear from Julian later, because he and I have exchanged many views about this. It's already well underway, this transformation. And um, my real worry about it is that, uh, that it, and in local authorities particularly, which I've been working with closely, that actually their lawyers will say, well, actually, shouldn't we be waiting for the new provisions of the bill because it's going to improve matters? 
Uh, and the submission that we, I've made already, which you might have read, says no, absolutely not. Actually, what the Cabinet Office ought to be doing is clarifying the fact that people who are pursuing um, innovation, innovative and strategic procurements under the provisions of the existing bill will be allowed to continue without a problem in the new bill. And I think there ought to be a cross-reference in the bill about the existing procedures, because essentially, this so-called flexible competitive procedure is basically an innovative, di a competitive dialogue um, dressed up slightly differently. That's my first point. The second point was that in um, the procurement bill uh, in the 2014 rules, one of the key objectives was to improve access for small and medium enterprises, particularly for startups. Uh, and that was something we took very seriously. And I have to say the biggest and most difficult political negotiation was with the member states who didn't want to remove some of the constraints on small enterprise. And I had to commission an impact assessment of my own uh, to take the negotiating meetings to get them to accept those simplifications. Now, the UK government, disappointingly, has not even introduced the present ones. Uh, and my big objection really uh, um, goes along what, with what many of you have said, is what's been left out of this. And the fact that the very feeble wording about deploying procurement in an innovative and strategic way is merely only advisory. I mean, even the so-called strategy statement, you just have to take regard to it, I think. A contracting authority must have regard to it. Uh, and the key centerpiece for delivering small business access is the so-called um, new digital procurement procedures, or for, uh, I can't remember exactly what it was called now, but um, my point was that it's not even mentioned in the bill. So how can parliament hold the government to account for delivering this really important instrument if it's not written in there. I mean, one of the characteristics of the European Bill is that where the Commission made commitments to introduce new elements, it's actually written into the Bill. Uh, so I think there is a huge amount of work to be done on this, and I hope that my colleagues in the House of Lords will really get stuck into it. Thank you, Malcolm. Um, well, I'll come back to that in a, in a moment. Um, uh, I've got some more questions really about about the uh, how we make how we move beyond the the, shad, the, the, the rather skeletal nature of the bill and, and, and make it work better but but, but maybe, maybe I should we, we, we can we can save that to the next phase um, our next speaker in order is Kate Goff um, who is since since she last was, was with us I'm fairly sure has been promoted uh, as a partner at Freshfield. So the first thing is we should all be congratulating Kate on her elevation to the partnership. And secondly, we wait with bated breath for your thoughts on transformation or not. What do the clients think? Are they horrified? Thank you, Michael. Um, it's very kind. Um, I think not transformation um, and echoing, I think, a lot of what people have been saying, it's obviously quite hard to tell if that's actually true at this point in time. And we need to see the detail and we need to see what's in the weeds. I think um, there was some nervousness about some points in the green paper that aren't in there around remedies for my clients coming from a private sector perspective. Um, and there's also a bit of a lost opportunity to clarify some of that. And maybe there are some trans transformational elements to the kind of remedies that might be available, but again, we kind of need to see the detail. Um, I think um, what's striking, I think, for my clients and for me is the point that's already been made about language, and perhaps not surprising in a kind of deep desire to move away from kind of what seemed to be historic or perhaps EU language. But I think what's making people quite nervous is the uncertainty that that causes. No, it's not clear on the face of the bill whether those are just language changes or if they're real substance changes. And I think what my clients are nervous about is that that creates uncertainty for them in their day to day and creates lots of risk of litigation. So rather than being transformative at the moment, I think what people are finding it is uncertain, which is exactly, I think, where they didn't want to be. I think there are obviously some, some opportunities, some great opportunities for um, development, for clarity, for um, certainty as we move forward, but I'm afraid I'm just kind of echoing a lot of what's been said so far, so perhaps I'll keep it short. Um, we just need to wait and see, and we need to see the detail to really understand where the transformation might be occurring and where those opportunities are going to really be grasped. 
Thank you, Katie. Um, and um, next, and as someone who shares B as his surname, not not being being uh, in any way uh, discriminated against by coming last, because we usually come first. Um, Julian Blake. Um, you, you, Julian, of course, as many all know, has many, many years experience working particularly with social enterprises, third sector economy and so forth. Um, and um, I'm sure that you have views on, 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 on the topic before us. Michael, thank you very much. Yes. So I'm talking from the, the practical perspective, the providers, the suppliers, um, public benefit providers in the um, public service commissioning environment. and um, the bill is disappointing to those sectors. Um, you can see simplification in the sense that it's a, a simpler rewording, really, of the existing principles, I would say. Um, not really providing greater freedoms and flexibilities. I agree with Malcolm on that. They're either there or possibly even reduced to some extent. Some improvement on transparency, pre-market engagement, and the transparency notices for direct award. Not transformative, not the wholesale change that the um, impact assessment report claims, um, doesn't address at all one of the two greatest problems that have, have been procurement for decades from the provider's perspective, and that's the way process has dominated and has made purpose get lost in the weeds, rather. Um, risk aversion being a cause of that. The impact assessment report notes that a possible risk in relation to the new bill is that risk aversion will continue, risk behaviours won't change, and flexibilities won't be used, which I think is a very clear risk and it actually very likely. Um, there's been nothing to change really the culture of process driving things. And as others have said, that puts our hope in the next level, the secondary um, legislation perhaps, or, or what we would hope to see in positive guidance, proactive guidance, saying what you can do, which the 2014 uh, rules did to, uh, a significant extent. Um, there's no distinctive reference to the distinctive issues for public service commissioning at all, which is especially disappointing because that, that was a point that was made very strongly in public benefit sector representations and was picked up by the House of Lords Public Services Committee. And I would say is the second big problem with the existing rules that the atmosphere that comes off those rules is, is, is very much the marketized. Uh, approach to things. It, it applies to all areas of um, market purchasing as well as public service commissioning, and public service commissioning is very different. So that's a very major disappointment. Um, there's no recognition really of distinctive types of provider. There's a little bit about um, carrying forward the UK government's view of mutual um, uh, public service mutuals, which hasn't really developed very much, but there's hardly anything else. The reference to SMEs and lots is just repetition, or Malcolm suggests less developed than it was before. Um, so this, this, this point about the marketization, obviously it's about competition law and, and uh, that's understandable and there are proper approaches to that, but competition law is not the only way of dealing with public services and procurement can be used for collaborative purposes. The impact, the impact assessment refers to competition and the virtues of competition and say the downside of lack of competition is collusion. Well, the upside of recognising that competition doesn't solve everything is collaboration. And as Malcolm rightly says, there have been very progressive developments in relation to collaborative approaches to procurement and commissioning, alliance contracts, the innovation partnership, which very disappointingly has disappeared um, in the uh, bill. It isn't, it isn't there, which which provides the concept of partnership in procurement, co-design, continuity from uh, a design to a delivery contract without having to go through a second procurement. Um, and there's no facilitation of what is really important from the public benefit perspective, provider perspective, which is when the providers are initiating, when the providers are uh, innovating, the, the procurement process doesn't naturally allow that recognition. It assumes that the, the purchaser knows what's required as opposed to the providers knowing what's required. There's not much actually on wider societal impacts, which was um, said to be quite an important thing here. Social value is not mentioned in the bill, I don't think, even though that's been highlighted as a major part of it. The idea of life cycle benefits through a contract being taken into account isn't referenced as it is in the current rules. Um, 
We can focus on some of the objectives, the public benefit value for money objectives. They're welcome because they're, they're the right objectives, but they're not elaborated upon, which might be helpful and maybe will be elaborated on in other sub subsequent um, secondary legislation, perhaps. Um, a couple of other things, challenge. Now challenge, is a major issue from two perspectives, I would say. One, challenges, challenge when it's justifiable is not easy for organizations that don't have great um, financial backing. You know, it's a massive risk. So the ease with which something could be challenged and corrected would be a really welcome practical development. And there's no sign of, sign of that. Similarly, the other big problem with challenge is tactical challenge. Big organizations challenge if they lose. And there ought to be something that, that tries to check that. Um, um, I, think, I think also what would be, um, Kieran talks about but, but more focus on contract, but more focus on um, the actual standard of contract writing would be very good um, in the public service domain. And last point, if we talk about innovation, I just flip back to the LGA report in 2017 on how it's called encouraging innovation in local government procurement. And there were 12 examples of what might be pursued and there's no sign of any of those here. I've, I've run out of my five minutes. I'll give you the first couple. Innovation in meeting citizens' expectations, innovation and in social value, mainstreaming, um, outcomes-based, a list of things that were very sort of focused on how procurement could be improved in relation to innovation. And there's not much sign of any of that in the bill. Thank you. So um, please do put your questions in the chat. Um, before I and, and um, can I pick up though, well, while you're doing that, I'm thinking of the, the the questions that you really need to get answered. And now's your chance. Twenty minutes to get your key questions uh, posed and answered. Um, while you're crafting those for us, uh, let me put something back to you, Julian, which has been picked up really, which which sort of blends the last two comments in the chat to some extent. Um, and let me be sort of provocative about it. I did promise I would be only positive today. Um, but um, so isn't it enough? Or is it, is it in order to be flexible and to enable the regime to respond to whatever, what, whatever the, the social demands are, doesn't the legislation really provide that flexible mechanism through the uh, national procurement policy statement, in that um, a contracting authority must have regard to it. I mean, and in its current format, for example, you've got paragraph 13, public procurement should be leveraged to support priority national and local outcomes for the public benefit. And there's a, you know, there's a lot more in, in that part of the statement. Now, that could be worked out into a, a more elaborate set of principles and norms, which authorities have to take account of. And, um, and requirements perhaps to explain themselves when they don't take account of them. Um, at the moment, you, it might, be, might, might fairly be said that it's a little difficult to see how anyone really could, any authority could be um, disciplined for not following the statement. But once you've got clause 12.8 in law, um, no, it's not 12.8, is it? Well, but the one I read, anyway, 12.9 must have regard to. If you deliberately just go and go for lowest price for something which obviously ought to have a more, more environmental or social content or whatever, um, don't we actually have the beginnings of something which enables us to craft a more sophisticated um, set of policy drivers in our procurement policy? Uh, well, to answer the first part of what you were saying, um, yes, the flexibilities are there. Um, I think, as Malcolm was saying, also the flexibilities are already there and flexibilities are already being used. So it's not so much the law that's the issue, either the existing law or the new law. It's the practice. And that's my point about will this change the practice? Because the flexibilities are there. So it's all about changing the practice and maximizing utilization of those flexibilities. There are things in the current bill that you can build upon to ensure to, to um, promote the idea that flexibilities should be used. And the national policy statement includes some of those references, although 
but there's, there's a bit more emphasis on national than, than local, I think. Um, and, and local emphasis would be good in terms of the, the real sort of practical flexibilities. Um, uh, so, I mean, and, and I mean, the, the, the previous rules moved us away from price only. And, and in a way, if we were still talking about price only, then that's an indication of why practice isn't needed to shift. So I, I would put, so to, to, so to be direct about it, I would say, looking at the, this bill, there are plenty of bits of it, phrases in it, um, that could be built into proper, uh, effective public service commissioning um, approaches. Uh, uh, but but the, the, real, the real point would be that the second, secondary legislation emphasizes that further. And I, as I said, I think what, was, what is really required is positive, um, proactive guidance that really encourages um, the flexibilities and uh, creative approaches, some of which are already happening, um, but, but, and we don't want to lose that. Malcolm, you've got your hand up. And you've done, and you've done, the, done my trick of not turning you. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, no, I just wanted to point out um, that uh, Scotland uh, is not taking this bill. Um, uh, if you look at the Scottish legislation at the moment, I mean, right at the very front of the bill, it says that a procurer must take account of um, sustainability, social value and innovation right at the very front of the bill. Uh, whereas this bill, uh, uh, and I think others are agreeing with the point, I mean, the, the, the National Procurement Policy Statement is actually quite long and complicated. Uh, and I think if we're going to make some serious progress, I mean, the government should be quite clear about the fact that these are key objectives and they ought to appear much more clearly in this than, than, than in this rather convoluted way they are at the moment. Well, uh, picking that up, is there not baked already some uh, the exciting prospect within the bill of some comp com competition for the best pro procure procurement statement between the UK and the Welsh procurement statements? I mean, and I don't mean that entirely frivolously. If mm. if if you do, if the legislation provides for those two positions, each one can ratchet off the other, hopefully up rather than down. Well, I, I mean. I think I think you are you're rather, you're hoping that might be the case. I mean, Wales has I think it's called the Wellbeing Act, which of course yeah. is, has framed their work. And and Wales and Scotland, Wales in particular, um, has adopted a, a far more progressive policy about using procurements in this way, even to the extent of having a best practice centre for pre-commercial procurement in a hospital in Wales. Uh, and I didn't get onto that, but I mean, I I find it very unsatisfactory that the NHS is excluded from this because actually we want to improve it. We want to improve NHS procurement. Right. Um, I want a couple more questions I wanted to come back to. Um, just in, in general terms, um, how do we make, again, putting it from, from an, one can see why it might be thought necessary to keep the bill somewhat open textured, particularly at the moment, where other departments are busily engaged entering into other agreements with other states, which will include government procurement chapters. Now, CPTPP has an existing government procurement chapter, so at least there we know what we're signing up for. But I mean, I don't know if any, for those of you look. If you look at the references that I've given in my the blog reference I put on the chat, there are some. There are one or two bits of the Australia agreement which are a little bit surprising, um, and there are obviously further agreements yet to come. There is a sort of whole sort of unknown unknown about what it is that our procurement law is going to have to sign up to in the course of the next few years, and in, isn't it inevitable that we end up having to have a bill which is is therefore rather open textured um, and we just sort of as it were have to live with it uh, particularly if we're now going to go down the fashion started last Friday of having agreements not only with nations but also with individual sub-central components of federal states starting as we've seen with Indiana which um struck me as an anyway, I've my frivolous remark about that is in my blog I won't repeat it Albert you had something you had a comment I, I think that the, the, the problem of that is that it opens procurement reform via FTA which creates if nothing else the the oversight of the coherence of the system very very tricky 
I think it would be preferable to have a very clear position on what the primary legislation in the UK has to do. And that is what the negotiating team for the FTAs has to agree with, with their parties. But otherwise, you're going to have issues like the Australian FTA, for example. Um, that it's a small technical point, but you know that when you cannot estimate the total value of a contract under the EU derived rules, you calculate it for 48 months. But under the Australian FTA, if you don't know the value, you treat the contract as covered. And in the um, Trade Australia and New Zealand bill, there is a specific power the government is asking so that they can change primary legislation, well, the, the regulations to basically propagate that to everyone. And, and the same thing is going to happen under the procurement bill, because the powers that the government has all of a sudden can be used to change domestic rules to propagate these changes from the FTAs. And maybe in five or 10 years, we'll have a, a system that doesn't make any sense because there are inconsistencies there. So that's, that's one observation. The other observation is um, to say uh, the, the, the advantages of the FTAs are, of course, premised on a, a balance between that change of rules and the schedules of coverage. If all of a sudden you're propagating the changes of rules to everyone, you're changing also the balance of all of the other FTAs. And I, and I don't know if the New Zealanders, for example, are happy to live with the Australian rules and their own negotiated um, schedule of coverage. So, so it makes life difficult for everybody. I don't think it's an advantage. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I suppose otherwise with, with the, with the, uh, this rather skeletal process the only control that parliament re retains is obviously it's it, it's usually rather limited control over secondary legislation and this explicit provision um and under the policy statement where at, at least it says that um the national policy statement can be voted down within a 40-day period of being laid before the before before the house um i don't suppose anyone actually believes that will ever happen. Um, but I suppose that that is a framework for there to be a debate about the policy statement as and when it is amended. And so that that is a at least a positive opportunity when Parliament must come forward, when, 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 a, when government, you would hope, must come forward and actually come up with some positive explanation on the floor of the, of, of part of the Houses of Parliament as to what actually it's putting into its policy statement and get beyond the, the rather open textured skeleton. Mm. Um, there was a couple of other uh, uh, important question about carbon, which um, I wanted to come back to, except yeah, here we are, now I can move it, um, which is sort of related to this, that under the current PPN, obviously carbon reduction plans under uh, are, are an important part. They're reflected in PPNs, both in England, both in the UK level and within Wales, and probably elsewhere, but I can't now remember. Um, these can be abandoned very, uh, but very quickly uh, with limited oversight. I mean, is there beyond what I've just in indicated about the control over the policy statement? Is there anything more we can expect to try and put in place to tie um, specific carbon reduction plans to the um, to, 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 to the legislative goals? <laughs> anyone anyone have a go at that one? Let me think about that. Uh, what I'm going to do now is ask the speakers in two minutes, perhaps to comment on anything that they have picked up in terms of what's been said, or what's been going on in the lively parallel commentary in the chat for those of you who've been able to follow it. And if you've been able to read, follow all the, all the links as well at the same time and take it all in, you're doing better than me. But there's a, now an awful lot of information we've managed to download. Um, and um, just to keep everyone on their toes, I'm going to do the call people, the, the pan, our panel up to comment on what we've had in the last 40, 45 minutes or so in um, an apparently random order. Um, <laughs> Kristen, would you like to go first? Um, sure. I've just been um, enjoying a lot of the exchange on SMEs and also local business, which isn't exactly the same thing, but often local businesses are small and, and medium sized. And I, I shared some stats in there that I read recently on how we're still falling short of the target of one in every three dollars spent with a small business. And oh. something that was mentioned earlier on the engagement notices and the duty to consider lots that we thought was 
missing um, was that it was optional to um, share the pipeline and planned notices or planning information, which is really important for small businesses because they need more pre-market engagement and lead time to kind of get ready for, for some of these. So there was a duty to consider lots, but we thought that it should also be a duty that they that um, a procurement authorities must consider provision for planned um, procurement and market consultation rather than having those as optional. So that was one thing that I wanted to add on the point around SMEs. And there was also some discussion around data. And I think it's interesting to note that data is really only mentioned once in the bill, which feels, um, you know, it's, it's just not a strong enough mention for us. There's not a clear reference to digital tools and data. And it seems to me that, um, you know, considering the impact assessment and all of the various benefits that were disclosed there from reduced um, costs to improved accountability, um, reduced scope for corruption, potential time savings. So there's there's financial savings, but also time and, and other non-financial benefits. It seems that we should be talking about data more than just around electronic invoicing. We should be making that a real um, central part of the primary legislation so that we can't deviate from that ambition. Um, in its implementation, right? We want a single, open, no. machine-readable, freely accessible portal. So that's something I wanted to make sure. Yeah. Can I just pick up that, because while you were speaking, I was looking at your, your chat. One of the things, the, the, the provision in, um, in the bill, which uh, enables you to exclude bids that rely upon non-treaty supplier subcontractors, and we can let, let's not debate about whether that's lawful or compatible with the GPA or not. That's a topic, an important topic discussion to be had. I'm not certain that it is, but let's just park that point for the moment. Um, the more sort of, the more urgent question is really, do you think that is simply comes out of, as it were, the, the, the sort of the trade negotiation perspective that this is a chip that, that trade negotiators want to be able to play to, to prize open um, trade? Or do you think there's actually been some research that there is, you know, that it is a real problem that lots and lots of contracts are going to uh, treaty UK or other treaty state suppliers, but subcontracting large parts of their their, their, their supply to China and India? Is it is that is it is it is it is it is it, is it, is it, is it a practical concern or a theoretical concern? Do you think? You're asking. Do you, have, do you have any know if there's data? Because you have, you have this data about direct yeah. and indirect, and I wonder if you've been able to get down to that level of granularity. Not I, me personally on that point, no. I'd have to check back and get, get back to you on that one. I don't know as much about the trade agreement side of things. Okay. Um, so next, at random, Kieran, would you like to have a quick reaction? Yes, uh, thank you, Michael. So uh, lots of interesting uh, comments from our speakers, much that I agree with. Um, given time constraints, I'll just pick a few. So it was an interesting, slightly terrifying perspective from Albert about we might not get the detail in the uh, secondary legislation and guidance, and we might actually have a, a wave of case law um, to finally tell us where the land lies. So that, that's quite an interesting one. Uh, like to Caroline's point about how often the word reasonably appears, that ties in nicely with Kate's point about the uncertainty. Um, that's a key concern for local government contacts as well. Um, would echo a lot of what uh, Julian said, um, hopefully aligns with some of my own comments about really the practice rather than the law being the area where we could uh, truly improve public procurement. And again, would su support the call for positive proactive guidance. Thank you, Karen. Um, Julian. Thank you. Yes, well, uh, I agree with Kieran. Um, practice, we don't want to lose the progress that has been made um, and interpretation is necessary for that and positive guidance. Um, so, for example, the innovation partnership has been lost, but the flexibility is there to bring it back um, through actual practice. Um, picking up on something Kieran said earlier, um, the, the procurement teams having more work, I think that's a good thing. Sorry, Kieran, um, because the idea of really engaging with the subject matter in a way that um, colleagues other than Kieran don't sometimes, 
Um, and, and, and that leads to the, to the whole point. You, get, you need to be producing the public service contracts that are refined in their specification, detailed in their communication provisions, long-term perspectives on improvement and, and, and development. Um, and too often in the past, we've had three-year service contracts and then three-year service contracts, which aren't progressive in, in those terms. And then just that point about reasonableness, it, it rather illustrates maybe, uh, I think we can all say, yes, it's quite a good idea that one set of laws is brought together. Um, but, um, so I think it was Caroline was talking about, you know, from the corruption perspectives and reasonably not being a good thing from that perspective. Well, from a interpretive, progressive um, use of flexibility, reasonable is quite a good word. Thank you. Um, that tension is, is so often there, obviously, often, isn't it? And that's one of the tensions which we're always living with, is the tension between the sort of, as it were, the progressive imperative and the integrity imperative. And we, um, you, can never, you can never keep everyone happy on that particular tension, I don't think. Um, not all the time, anyway. Um, Albert, would you like to have another quick crack? Thank you. Yeah, the, the, the one thing that jarred me a bit was to, to hear Kieran say that he, he sees a difference between meat and mud. So I think we're going to need a section, you know, a, a whole discussion on that. Um, because <laughs> I, I, I think if, if you read um, clause 225D, where it refers to price in all circumstances, it's arguable that nothing is changing. But, um, but, but the other one is that sometimes we, we need to be careful about the unintended consequences of changes. So it, it also surprised me a bit um, to hear Julian say it's great to see more pre-market engagements. Because um, when it comes to unsolicited tenders, which is something we don't regulate, and it comes to this initiative of the supplier to try to propose something, if you're the supplier and you actually propose something that they're going to take on and want to um, uh, take to, to uh, procurement, maybe you're going to have to be barred from that procurement on the basis of section, sorry, clause 15.5, because you have such an advantage in that you have designed it and imagined it that they cannot but exclude you because nobody else will understand the, the technical specification. So, so I think we need to be very careful with how this is going to be interpreted and, and applied. And sometimes things that we think are going to help specific operators may not help them in the long run. But I, I see Julian is burning to intervene, so I'll, I'll just cut myself short. Well, I, I, would, I would like just to come back on that. I, I totally understand that point. But in a way, that mm. point has been the big problem in the past, is that um, when those dialogues have started, innovative dialogues, the, that, that exact point has been made and it said, right, we can't carry on this progressive dialogue because we will unfairly prefer you or we will be seen to be unfairly preferring you. That's my whole point about different approaches where the fairness doesn't depend on not being able to speak to people who have valuable contributions to make. You can be, maintain the fairness principle and the objective principle without having rigid rules about excluding people that you're talking to. Mm. Thank you. Right, well, we've only got a few seconds left in the, but but um, the the key key thoughts coming up in 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 the few remaining seconds, um, Malcolm. Uh, well, I think um, I mean in response to the last points, of course, the big advantage of the innovation procurement uh, tool that we developed was that if it, if it was if you were buying something that was genuinely not available from anywhere, that you could actually commence a process of developing that. Um, it's very interesting. I refer you, I, I, for those of you that haven't looked at Innovate UK's website, there's a very large report about pre-commercial procurement. Uh, and pre-commercial procurement is not um, a, a, a procedure covered by either any of these rules at the moment. Uh, and my, my friends in the European Union have said to me, this was a mistake that we made. Because actually, um, more people would be using pre-commercial procurement if it was recognized as a procedure in the legal framework. And actually the UK government has a fantastic opportunity to move ahead of Europe here by developing uh, this and also to allow that to proceed from procurement to a full contract, uh, which is not something that happens with the current SBRI. So that's my, my big ask. And I hope that someone will be developing some amendments that we can put forward on that. So, Rory, if we can extend for another two two minutes, we'll be, we're nearly there. Um, let's see, uh, Kate, what's your what, summing up in a few in a, in, in a minute or two? What, what what's your key reactions to our discussion? 
one of the things oh, yeah. that I've picked up in the chat that I think is really interesting is the focus that everyone has on, on the social value element and the aims of procurement law and something that Caroline was also talking about, you know, to be truly transformative, do we need to think about what we're trying to achieve? And I think that that is a sadly a missed opportunity, but one that perhaps is not completely gone and that we hope when we get the more detailed legislation, we can see how in practice there may in fact be a focus on social value in the legislation itself and not just in the policy. And we can hopefully try to develop that, but I just thought that was a real takeaway for me, the focus yeah. that people have, I think, across all different sectors and different mm. perspectives on social value and the purpose of procurement. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I suppose the, the concern there is that is that the bill is structured in such a way that it could become law, leaving very little space for further debate around those topics, except perhaps around such debate as can be forced in the context of a negative procedure on 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 the on the policy statement or some other provision. Um, but there is a danger that this becomes very much. Um, uh, that is that that, 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 there isn't, that we're back to the bad old days of procurement law being set without any proper legislative um, review or review from civil society more generally. Caroline, um, so should we borrowing? Should, let, it sounds like you, that, that some of us think we should be borrowing the Tajikistan model, albeit that I've never read it. So I, I I'd be taking it blind if I just took your Tajikistan model. <laughs> think, thank you. Well, look, I think actually the older Tajikistan was better than the current one, but. I think it's been a fascinating conversation because I obviously I don't know the practice in the UK, but what I'm hearing is particularly with social value and um, and SMEs or at least smaller businesses, medium companies can probably look after themselves. This is all so complex that pr procedurally, and there's so much in it, that the lack of transparency is likely to say to, the, to, to smaller businesses, the overhead of participating is too much. Fair enough in the bigger stuff. So we may need to have some differentiation here to make this work. But I think it was either Julian or Malcolm, I forget which, who talked about risk aversion. And I have to say, looking at this system now, and until we see the whole package, if I were mm. a procurement official, I just want to sit on my hands. And that was my contact and my comment about reasonable. It is so scary because I really don't have any feeling if reading this of what I may or may not do as a procurement official and where my back might be caught if I try and be innovative and I can see that could instigate instead of a more transformative approach and I know we should all be doing more work and all of that but people just said you know what what is it I'll, I'll just buy IBM it's safer for me so I'm concerned about that very concerned about that. Thank you very Thank you. much indeed, Caroline. Well, that's been a great conversation. Um, it perhaps confirms my overall impression from a number of discussions the last few days that there's an awful lot of learning still and talking still to be done to understand where this is going. And, and a lot of sort of worrying gray areas or blank areas still left, which we're all going to have to work on and try and find ways of pressuring government in, 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 in beefing up. And to some extent, coming back to some of the expectations um, that, were, that were raised by the green paper process. Um, from my own point of view, the one thing I'm very, we, we covered a great deal of ground today. I'm very glad to say that no one has said anything about framework agreements and dynamic markets, because I'm supposed <laughs> to be speaking about them next week. And I'm completely puzzled by that part of the legislation. So if anyone has any clever thoughts on that, please send them to me privately or even anonymously, because I've got to think of something interesting to say. I'm very worried. Uh, I note that, 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 that dynamic availability is what they apparently was the word that was described in the German army in the last 10 years when you didn't have anything it was it, you had dynamic availability and I have a horrible feeling that dynamic in the phrase dynamic market may may be the same sort of weasel word but hey ho we will see um Rory and is uh unless there's anything I've forgotten to say, and you probably want to do some sort of general wrap up, but in terms of the, this discussion, can I thank all the speakers for their um, lively comments and comments on comments, and for all of the really excellent comments in the chat. We haven't had a time to sort of bring up people to speak, but the, the chat has been at least as lively as the, as the, as the, as the live conversation. Um, so please do, um, go back and, and study it. I will certainly be taking time to go back and reread this properly so that, um, because there's a lot of material to cover uh, and I look forward to seeing you all at, at, at other future events. We, we've got a way to go yet on, in getting, 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 getting our procurement law the way it ought to be. 
Fantastic. Um, thank you very much indeed uh, to Michael, uh, to all our panellists and to our wonderful audience for your contributions. Um, and that is all for the May POCO call. Thank you very much, everyone. Good to see you all. Thank you. Cheers. Thank Bye. you. Bye.